It's been a wild week of weather. Looking up there in the sky, all the things, all at once, a buffet of climate things. But here we are, and it's Friday, ready to talk about the news. So, today on CityCast Las Vegas, I'm here with co-host Vogue Robinson and contributor Andrew Crawley, and we're going to talk about that Badlands litigation saga, wonder if our politicians are maybe getting too old, and... Cardi B's outrageous mic drop. It's Friday, August 4th. I'm David Figler, and here's what Las Vegas is talking about. Doug Robinson, Andrew Crawley, welcome to CityCast Las Vegas Friday News Roundup. Yeehaw. Hey, hey. Yeehaw, indeed. <laughs> Golly, the city is ready to spend another $1.5 million <laughs> litigating the Badlands golf course controversy this year. Andrew, what's going on here? Yeah, this is going to take some interactive multimedia charts and some PowerPoints to explain because, yeah, it gets yes. um, labyrinthine, if I'm pronouncing that correctly. <laughs> um, yeah, on Wednesday, the city council approved spending another $1.5 million to continue fighting this uh, lawsuit and uh, legal battle that the uh, would-be developer of uh, the de- defunct Badlands Golf Course um, has been uh, fighting over for, God, years now. And this uh, adds to almost uh, $6 million that the city has already spent um, litigating this saga. To kind of give some quick context, uh, this is this is kind of like the, the Jarndyce and Jarndyce lawsuit in, in, in Bleak House. It's just incredibly <laughs> uh, complicated and, yeah. and, uh, and Byzantine. But um, in 2015, Johan Lowy um, proposed to develop the defunct um, dead Badlands golf course into a residential community with various levels of, you know, density and, and housing and stuff like that. For our listeners, where is that even located? Ah, so this is in the uh, Queens Ridge neighborhood, which is pretty much like off of uh, West Charleston between like Wallapai and Rampart. A nice uh, suburban community um, had a beautiful golf course, but Badlands was just you know losing money every year, and it finally just you know shut down. Mm. So Johan Lowy and his company EHB, um, which are the developers of Tivoli, um, proposed doing uh, a massive redevelopment of the land, uh, 250 acres. Now the weird, complicated thing is, and and your your insight in, into the legal niceties of this might come into uh, to come into play, mm-hmm. David, um, is that apparently there you know, <laughs> yeah. legal. Legal niceties. Johan apparently had entitlements to the land, but not necessarily the zoning. So the city ultimately, with pressure from the Queens Ridge neighborhood, who were against developing this uh, this golf course, the city rejected his redevelopment proposal, and he sued them in 2015. And um, since then, he's won multiple judgments in this saga, and the city's on the hook for... Um, God, it looks, I'm doing the math. It's like a hundred, $150 million when you add some of these judgments up. Um, yep. so should the city go back into the, into the fray and spend more money on, you know, litigating this to, you know, maybe save themselves, uh, uh you know, a hundred million dollars. So they voted to do it. Um, Victoria Seaman, um, city councilwoman, who's also running for mayor was against the idea and she has been clamoring to, to settle this case once and for all. So pretty wild. And when, you know, Victoria Seaman is the voice of reason, um, yeah, we're again, we're living in topsy-turvy well, land. This is a bunch of rich people fighting over how many houses should be built on a janky golf course in a richy rich neighborhood. Uh, yeah. It has cost the taxpayers tons of money because there have been politicians who have tried to block it. There have been lawsuits, some ridiculous and frivolous, accusing city council members of anti-Semitism and whatnot, including our friend Bob Coffin, which did go anywhere. But there have been plenty of victories. And now, yeah, you're right, Andrew. This is, you know, gone to nine figures that the city will have to pay a private, already very wealthy developer for their Mm -hmm. shenanigary that the court has said happened. And Victoria Seaman, like most politicians in that area, and that is her ward, you know, pick sides. 
And she's running for mayor. And who even knows? But she has consistently voted against spending more money on litigation and just wanting to lay down. But at the, you know, at the, at the 19th hole, uh, <laughs> somebody's going to get really rich off of the public uh, coffers. And it ain't anyone in this conversation. All right, Vogue, what do you think of this whole mess? It's a mess. Uh, I don't even understand why people don't want housing to go right there. Because well, it's how many houses. The real Richie Riches who are there wanted to be limited development. The developer right. wanted to put as many houses as he could possibly put on that parcel so he can make even more money. Right. And so that was what the fight seemed at its core to be about when you get away from all the, is this a proper land development? Were there the right like ordinances or zoning right. or any of that stuff. It's just this big ass space of green that is, uh, you know, unutilized and, you know, low-key a wasted space. Uh, so, I mean, if they don't transform it into a park at some point, I, I hope they come up with some kind of solution because this is stupid. And I'm like millions, like I'm looking at it, it. The number of times that judges have ruled against the city just shows that, that they're not going to win that clearly there's, you know, there's space for this developer to be able to build something else there. Good luck. I mean, do you think a developer in the interest of the city in which uh, he lives and thrives and profits should just like say, look, I'm right. I want an apology. I'll take some money, but I don't need to bankrupt the city over this one stupid golf course project. Is that an unreasonable thing to expect of a human being in our community? If you're asking like uh, whether a super rich developer can act um, humanely and reasonably, yeah, that's a bit of a high bar. I think the reason why it's gone on so long is because you're dealing with with two two groups of folks who have an inflated sense of um, what is the word entitlement. So it feels like on one end, you know, that the city council is like, well, you know, we said no and and no means no, you're not allowed to do this. And the developer is like, actually, I can. And the the judge, it seems like the law is on the developer's Actually, side. Actually, numerous judges. Numerous yeah. judges are on his side. And so I don't think it's on him to step down. It's it's on the city council to make some decisions and some concessions because they're fighting a losing battle that's just spilling out all of the money, all of the sand, all of, mm -hmm. all of the things all across money, the valley. Money that could go for social services, education. homelessness, all that stuff, education, whatever the city mm -hmm. spends its money on wisely Orange would codes. now go into one person's hands. I don't, there was a settlement, right? But what you said there was a settlement that fell apart, Andrew? So there was a settlement deal put together last year, mm -hmm. um, and the total price tag would have been sixty-four million dollars. And um, it's it, it kind of gets kind of arcane, but uh, the deal apparently fell apart because Johan Lowy accused the city of like changing the terms of the deal at the last second. Probably did. So there's a lot of you know sort of impregnable bad faith. I, I think that's at the core of this that suggests to me that. Neither side is going to back down anytime mm -hmm. soon. And um, and I'll give credit to Victoria Seaman. I mean, it seems to me that she's been consistent in saying, we just need to settle this thing calmly and reasonably and for some kind of price. And I mean, and if it comes to, you know, to $50 million, I think they'll be getting a, you know, a pretty sweet uh, friends and family discount at this <laughs> point because the numbers that are coming out of these judgments are... Um, you know, pretty, uh, pretty shockingly high. Right. The two, two, 2021, it was 34 million. And then uh, the next award was 48 million. And then uh, one of the attorneys who represents Lowy said uh, last year, the third ruling could cost the city upwards of 50 million. So, right. you know, he can he can move and build something somewhere else. <laughs> the amount of money he's just getting in settlements and do we need more housing really i understand you know real estate is, is a lucrative investment but do well, we really these need were more not going to be affordable houses exactly like do we way. need more of <laughs> right. this kind of housing in that area you know i'm sure it would build up a lot for what tavoli needs to be able to continue existing <laughs> Oh. I mean, wouldn't that be the ultimate revenge, right? If he actually comes to some terms uh, of some development density and then he like busts out some affordable housing right on the doorstep of Summerlin. Aww. Shock and awe. That would be so nice. nice. I mean, hey, does, does Vegas even need more fancy houses around a golf course like this? I mean, what what else could be on that 250 acre site uh, apart from our you know dream utopia of affordable housing for all? I feel like the utopia is the best possible answer to that question. <laughs> I really thought you were going to say water park. No. Bring back, you know, God. a super wet and wild with their stuka. No. Or maybe just like wet and mild, the safe and sane version of 
wet and wilds, right? No. So you're that you're voting a... for Utopia, Vogue? Yeah, my vote is for the Utopia. What do you need? More casinos, obviously. It's Las Vegas. Maybe a Super Dotties. I hate you so much right now. Ugh. Andrew, what do you think? I'm, I'm getting nightmarish, stay puffed, marshmallow man, Dottie's monster visions in my mind. Thank you for planting that, uh, David. Um, sure. Yeah, I mean, so many, so many options, right? I mean, one of the, I guess, one of the sort of like sensible things to do if we're if we're sort of dreaming responsibly would be to convert, you know, the golf course into a eco-minded, you know, public park, uh, maybe yeah. something a la, you know, the Springs Preserve, you know, I mean, that's mm. 250 acres is, uh, you know, not a not a small plot of land. Yeah. And there's a lot to be done with it. There is existing housing on there. And I'm just wondering if we just, again, kick out the Richie Riches and give it to a bunch of teachers. Kick out. Oh, I'm such a socialist today. What's I love going that on? You're just, I, I love that you're unhousing people in order to make your dream happen, David. I think I'm they'll concerned. land on their feet. Yeah. <laughs> unhousing for the ultimate good. You can't kick people out of their homes in the name of no. of, of affordable Look, I, housing. No, obviously. But, you know, I've sat through a number of these city council meetings and the, the privilege is strong with these folks. I mean, mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. they do take up a lot of time of government business. I'm not the hater on capitalism that I think that I present myself to be. I want people to have nice houses and live in quiet harmony. But this Badlands is just bad blood. All right. Speaking of uh, elected officials who have made some horrible decisions that have impacted us. Oh, my God. uh, (laughs) Nice. (laughs) There's a, a new discussion that probably hasn't been held with such fervor in the United States in over 60 years, and and we're kind of talking about the maximum age for people to be in office. I, I know you all have heard about uh, some of the discussions around people like uh, Senator Feinstein and Senator McConnell. I mean, Feinstein's 90, McConnell's in his 80s. Mm. They both have had very public incidences recently where people are talking about their age possibly being a disqualifier. Of course, both President Biden and former President Donald Trump are not young people uh, any longer. Uh, We've also got some older politicians in our state, too, though we should be clear, none seem to have exhibited Uh, at least in public, any of the symptoms that we've talked about so far, like freezing up in front of a mic or forgetting to say I uh, to your own vote, Mm. the question sort of comes up again. And I say not since 60 years, because that's when the famous counterculture conversation from um, don't trust anyone over 30 started, right? So let's talk about (laughs) Clark County. I I mean, we've got some folks here that are um, up in age. And most notably, we've got uh, Mayor Carolyn Goodman. She's aged 84. Really? Uh, She's 84? No She's 84. Yeah. Okay, sorry. Continue. (laughs) She must moisturize. Um, We've got the chair of the county commission, uh, Jim Gibson, is 75. The co-chair, Tick Sigerbloom, 74. Dina Titus. Our representative from the South here in Congress is 73. Uh, There's a representative uh, in the state legislature, John Hamburg. He's 74. We have a Supreme Court Justice, Chris Pickering. She's 70. District Court judges, uh, Mark Denton is 71. There are others. You know, we talk uh, in this country a lot about people getting to a certain age. I'm thinking of Ruth Bader Ginsburg and others who really are in the center of this conversation. Y'all, I don't want to be the ageist person. I'm the oldest person on this uh, podcast right yeah, now. You're, you're 79. But I am. <laughs> e- emotionally, Oops. 15. Physically. There you go. And you take like the average of those two. 79, and you average it out, and that's actually my bio date. Oh, but God. should there be age limits on holding public office? That's provocative. But it's part of this national conversation. Yeah. I never thought I would be intrigued by that idea. But yeah, reading some of these news stories makes it sound like an intriguing notion. And, you know, I never thought we would be talking about basically like your fundamental cognitive fitness to, you know, do the job of being an an elected public official. So 
I, I would say I, I'm definitely interested in having the, you know, the conversation. And um, it doesn't seem to me to be an unreasonable, uh, you know, question to ask. So what, what do you think, Vogue? It's unreasonable. Um, I think that it's deeply ageist. And I think that there's, you know, if we're talking about someone's cognitive abilities, then have them take, you know, tests and go through, um, you know, checking on. I mean, I feel like they make so certain elected officials, depending on where you're at. You make enough money and get good enough health care to be able to get tested by excellent doctors mm-hmm. to see how's your brain, how's your mind, how's your heart? Because there are people who are much younger who are not in good health and also like different diseases can affect the brain regardless of age. So it's not about the age. It's how's your brain? How, <laughs> how, mm-hmm. how is your, how, right, is your right. how is your overall health and capacity to function? I think that's the question. And so obviously, you know, what we witnessed was, you know, I don't know what happened. Uh, I don't I don't have the inf- enough information about um, the freeze as of now it's now titled. <laughs> but overall, it's, you know, it's really a concern for health. And, and are you able to, to do your job? Mm-hmm. And there's ways to make things accessible as well. So, you know, there are people I'm still teaching how to use computers. And, you know, there are certain jobs you can't get without filling out an application online. And so those things are barriers for people. But I think that we need to be focusing on accessibility in some of these spaces and then also being realistic about if if you're so foggy or if you, you know, if you have certain amounts of like Alzheimer's coming onto your your mind, then, yeah, at a certain point, you're at a decline and you, you may not be in a good enough shape to to do your job to the best of your ability. Let's flip that script, though. There are age limits on the minimum side. Right. I mean, right. you can't even be the president right. unless you're 35. Mm-hmm. You can't be in Congress unless you're 25. Isn't that the same thing, Andrew? Uh, if there's bottom uh, qualification that we generalize with an age number, can't we do that on the top two? Yeah. Right. And th- that's what I'm thinking, too, is, is like, yes, there is going to be some level of sort of functional ageism, you know, built in. And, you know, these aren't going to be like the, the sort of, you know, finest of of knives that are you know making these decisions of what's the age what's the minimum age cut off what's the maximum age cut off so i think you have to accept that you know it's not going to be such a, a sort of swift you know easy solution so yes it's going to be ageist but i think you can have these conversations and enact some you know some filters in a way that's you know responsible and and reasonable one thing that's interesting to me is that th- this conversation seems to be emerging you know about uh, about the you know the gerontocracy that that we live under, <laughs> and it's 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 kind of it's really emblematic to me about what seems to me like the, the the sort of really radical growing ideological rift between younger generations and mm. older generations. You know, millennials and boomers, and they fundamentally disagree on um, you know what are the values that we should pursue in our in our in our sort of you know public policy and things like that and i have in mind a recent you know s- study i read that uh, republicans which you know they, they tend to be older they you know they tend to be white if they had to choose you know a good economy over you know battling you know climate change they would go with the economy every time mm. you see that yeah. completely flipped whenever you're you're polling you know millennial uh, voters and, and younger voters um so i think it's an interesting conversation that kind of reveals that tension this generational tension that um t- to me has never been uh, so pronounced in, in my lifetime. Mm. Well, Vogue, I mean, you know, you hear very loud and strong voices like Greta Thunberg, you know, the Swedish uh, uh, environmentalist, the activist there, who's like, you know, the older folks in charge are screwing us. They don't have to live mm-hmm. with the world that they're leaving behind. We do. They shouldn't be the ones in charge because they have less life in front of them statistically than we do. Is there any credibility to arguments that, you know, people who have just been there forever who don't have a lot at stake because they're not going to be around as long uh, shouldn't be pulling the levers of uh, policy? Well, I think that has more to do with term limits and um, voting. Like I know, you know, 2008, 2009, you know, I remember getting people being like, uh, young people aren't voting. And there were so many campaigns to get young people to vote and whether or not we're allowed, what age you are to be able to be allowed to run for office. So I think it's a, I think my answer is three pronged. I'm going to try <laughs> to get here. But one, we're hashing out a policy here. I love it. But I think like one, it's, I think younger people should be allowed to run for office because if if 18 means you're young enough to die for this country, then you should be able to do everything else for and about this country. So that's one. Yeah. <laughs> Including president. You're right for the 18-year-old president. 
You're ready for Dang. some pop singer. You're ready I for Taylor it. Swift, although she's not 18. If Donald Trump can be president of this I'm, entire I'm country. I'm ready for TikTok president. <laughs> if Donald Trump can be president, then I think with the proper like counsel and a great team behind you, yeah, let's see what an 18-year-old will do. How are we currently doing? Are you yeah, happy I'd with leadership? So that one, two, <laughs> my second prong, I think there, we should be looking at term limits for some of these positions. Supreme Court judges, for example. So what are, what are these terms and how come you get to be on there until you die? No, that probably doesn't make any sense, especially considering, uh, you know, through the 60s, what laws were in place uh, and what I would have been allowed or not allowed to do as a black person, as a woman. So two term limits. And then I forgot my third one because I'm so pissed off now. Thanks, David. <laughs> well, sure. But here's the thing. Here's the argument against term limits is that you lose experience and people who have all this experience aren't going to be in there. And who who fills that gap? Lobbyists for private entities. So they stay so there as, as mentors that you build a system that requires an intergenerational conversation. And so like, okay, mm. if your term is done, that doesn't mean, okay, you just leave and live on a farm somewhere and nobody ever hears from you. You're, you're somewhere building houses, Habitat for Humanity houses. You stay and you are the counsel to that are you, person. Are you dissing Jimmy Carter? He should have stayed in the conversation loved, and not just go and help people. I love Habitat for Humanity. I'm just Sold saying. out with that Habitat for Humanity. And I think you should definitely be allowed to rest. He deserves some rest too. But I'm saying when we retire people, and they finish their service and then they get sent out to pasture and nobody asks questions about what they're doing and how they're doing them. We're throwing away knowledge when they could mm -hmm. be staying nearby and helping with making sure that we're doing that, that each elected official is able to do the best possible job that they have. And people don't keep starting off from scratch, wiping a cabinet clean and being like, we're going to do it a different, entirely different way. Fuck the data. <laughs> Let's just do whatever we want to do. I mean, that's interesting, too, because, you know, it's not just elected officials, but it, you know, we, we are a bureaucracy and, you know, uh, Las Vegas is not immune from that, too. I mean, we've got a director of public works that uh, tweeter and uh, director of the Beverly Theater, Kip Kelly, pointed out, had been in that spot for over 40 some years. Now, I'm guessing that when that person was in school learning all the, you know, neat things about car culture, <laughs> um, maybe some things have changed in 40 years. Maybe some innovations or some policies uh, are new. And yet you've had one person in charge of like all the public works in Southern Nevada for over 40 mm -hmm. years. And people wonder, why is traffic so screwed up? Why is development so like haphazard? And why are we not a thoughtful community? Mm -hmm. Well, I'm not blaming it all on one person, but right. certainly if one person has been in there forever, I mean, look, even as a lawyer, we have to take classes all the time. And, Teachers you know, who knows if forever. a lot of, lot of lawyers would be able to pass the bar 15 years out of law school or 20 years out of law school. And yet we're mm -hmm. all still out there practicing. Even the DMV, you know, has certain age requirements that you start taking more tests and they look at you a lot closer. When you're 71, you can't renew your license online anymore. You got to do vision tests and all that other mm -hmm. stuff. I mean, are right. we missing the boat here? Let me just throw out this question. Is it ages to talk about people's advanced age when they're running for office? No, I don't think it's inherently ageist at all. I think the the specter of ageism looms whenever you start, you know, introducing conversations that may suggest that, you know, groups as a whole are a certain way. And so I think I like what Vogue said about, you know, being sort of specific and functional and, you know, talking about your specific abilities. So to take your DMV example, I mean, they're not just checking what age you are. They're just saying, you know, we're going to check your eyesight. We're going to, you know, check your, you know, your, your reaction time. We're going to, you know, check your general awareness and your fitness to drive. That seems to me to be, you know, pretty reasonable. Is it, you know, ageist um no but it you know when you have attitudes that accrete around these kind of things you know that's where the ageism occurs and um i think the question you know, is inherently uh, ageist andrew i think if if age is your only question instead of qualifications and like mental acuity if the question only comes up because of the age then it is so i think you yeah but you, you can't deny that i think you have to standardize the testing that's all i'm saying because like even for yeah. me, my vision is fine, but like I know P I have friends whose vision like they're in bifocals now and like <laughs> legally blind without their glasses and they're in their twenties. So you're not going to test them because they're young. Let Let's well, not forget we did we did give a test to uh, 
Former President Donald Trump, what he described as a difficult cognitive test that he said he aced. Um, and then we just kind of moved on. I, I, is it just, is it even possible? No, say. Man, woman, camera, whatever. Chair, whatever, Chair. yeah. <laughs> That's all it takes. Yeah, you got the power, baby. Keep that power, baby. He knows his downs. All right. Well, uh, going from 80-year-olds to a 30-year-old, let's talk about Cardi B. <laughs> Whenever celebrities come to Vegas, there's always a high potential for chaos. We are seeing a lot of it, and Cardi B is not immune. So what's the latest exploit that our, our good friend, good friend of the pod, Cardi B, is up to? <laughs> Vogue, you want to take this one? Sure. <laughs> Oh, David, you're supposed to... number one is Cardi B and Cardi B is always with it. Uh, and she's never been um, shy about fighting somebody like she is who she is. It's always been very clear. If you hit her, if you talk some mess to her, she will just reach across and hit you like that's that's part of a part of the fame. Some of it is just because she's very direct. Um, anywho, she came to town. She's performing at Dre's Beach Club on the Strip on Saturday, July 29th. It has been happening a lot. What's been happening a lot is that people, it, audiences have been throwing things at our entertainers. So between uh, dancers, singers, rappers, et cetera, people have been throwing things on stage. And that's just not here in Vegas. It's all over the place. There was a video of Tyler, the creator, being like, I don't want you guys as shit like why are you throwing your things onto my stage i don't want to i don't want your beanie babies i don't want your beanie babies to yourself uh one woman threw her at her mother's ashes on stage at a pink concert the fumes the mother fumes like came out of the ziploc bag onto the stage so that was horrible in this scenario cardi b the rapper bringing it back to cardi b yes (laughs) Cardi B, the rapper, was performing at Dre's Beach Club on the Strip, and uh, somebody threw like their not the whole cup, but they just kind of shoved their cup forward to get ice and water or whatever. I don't know what was in the cup onto what? Cardi's body. As soon as it happened, knee jerk reaction: Cardi looked through the mic directly yep. into the audience, hit somebody in the face, uh, and so now that microphone, said microphone, is is apparently uh, on sale on the internet. And for a total amount right now, fetching as much as a hundred, a uh, hundred k on eBay. So if you would like that wow. microphone, I don't know how it's verified uh, that it was. Well, actually I'm gonna actually the say mic. shout out to a uh, local resident Scott Fisher, mm-hmm. uh, a a longtime Las Vegan who uh, owns that equipment and who retrieved it and who decided to put it up on eBay and donate the proceeds to charity. So, oh, uh, uh, way to go, Scott there? Fisher. How do we know that's the mic, David? That's oh, the- trust me. I, Scott Fisher is a very reputable source. Okay. So uh, wow, that's cool. he it's has going to been charity. in that business for a really long time. It was his mic. Oh, so he's like he the sound guy. It up. He, if you want to call it that, yes. He was the sound guy. He was the guy whose microphones were being used by Cardi B, for sure. In fact, wow. the, his, little back, his backstory on that was that he was just at home, and he got a bunch of text messages and videos, and he's like, oh, my fucking equipment. But then he decided, you know, I can make something out of this, and even TMZ's reported on it, but uh, it, it's going to charity, not in the Scott's pocket. Mm. So good, good on oh, Scott that's Fisher. cool. Yeah, I, I was going to go on some rant about how everything's monetized, but um, <laughs> if it's going to charity, I'm pro-monetization. <laughs> Work. So this is what we've got going on. So, I mean, do y'all think, um, you know, fans are getting too frisky? Do we do we need to do a better job of protecting entertainers that come to town? Or is this just deal with stuff being thrown at you? What do y'all think? Well, I, that's a great question. And I, I think fans don't, un, I don't understand what is happening because mm-hmm. has it, it hasn't always been happening. I mean, I get it. Back in Vegas in the glory days, women purportedly threw their panties at one Mr. Tom Jones. That's different. And that was considered to be <laughs> clever or funny or whatever it was, or maybe they were just trying to get his attention. I know room keys have been thrown on oh. to uh, equally handsome crooners. But what is it with the fans? Why? Is it just because everyone wants to be famous? Everyone wants to be in the show. Everybody wants to have their viral moment, and it doesn't matter yep. if they're doing good behavior or bad. Yeah, I feel like that's part of it. I feel like a we're we're like cave people still thawing out from 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 COVID, mm-hmm. you know, lockdown and isolation. So we're still learning to be like social animals again in some way. But to your point, David, yeah, I feel like you know people are just constantly chasing viral clout 
And I mean, there are entire TikTok accounts and, and YouTube creators whose entire premise is like doing outrageous things in public just to get the views. And they'll put themselves in dangerous you know, situations where they're confronting people or, or scaring them or you know, things like that. And I'm just like, man, the, the chase for virality definitely takes some uh, strange turns. So I, I certainly think that's, uh, that's part of it. Mm. Vogue, why people out of control? Bro. I have no freaking clue, but I, I know it costs too much to to be to get to a concert and to get seats that are close enough to actually be in arm shot. <laughs> of, I know, of a really. Star. I would love to be in throwing distance. Right. It's way too much money to be spending <laughs> to be kicked out of the concert. So, I mean, I, I don't have money to waste like that. Like if I came to the show and I'm that close, I just want to see the see the performer. I just want to bask in the glory, scream, sing the song. I don't know why people mm-hmm. keep throwing stuff, but um, I love that Adele <laughs> <laughs> cussed at her audience and was like, I dare y'all to throw something at me. She I'll did. Throw. She pre I it. saw yeah. that. Oh. So Adele threatened and Cardi just did the action to show you. Y'all can play if you want to. Yeah. And and she fired that thing like a sniper shot. Was I mean, cool. it, it it was. It was like it was a excellent. Chinese throwing star. I, yeah. Is, is that the right reaction to, you know fight stupidity with violence? I mean, Cardi B filed a police report against the person who threw some water or whatever it was on her. Should Cardi B be in trouble for hitting someone with a much harder thing than what was thrown at her? I don't know if the ends justify the means, but I bet you people ain't going to be throwing stuff at Cardi anymore. Um, That's what I'll say about that. I I think, you know, uh, a performer walking off the stage and punishing the entire audience is, you know, weirdly like not unreasonable if you know things have reached this this point of frustration where this is happening so much mm. that uh the public kind of maybe needs to learn to like behave in public spaces again like the bus driver situation i'll pull over this bus i don't know if you guys ever rode the school bus but yeah. <laughs> like oh y'all y'all want to sit down and be quiet i'll pull over this bus so yeah the performances stop i mean that's money and i feel like i bet you audience members would sue. I bet you there would be people who would be like, oh, the person uh, walked off stage. Well, I paid so much and I sh- I'm entitled to a refund because this per- performer didn't keep performing. I feel like what's going to happen long term is we're going to start seeing, you know, our performers it, behind plexiglass or, you know, we're not going to get those seats that are that close anymore. We're not going to have them walk through the center of the aisle. Like we're not going to get b- those it's gonna be like going to the bank. And yeah, right. we're not going to get these beautiful interact- like the interactions with our. Yes, I was just thinking that I was like, it's going to be the Pope, you know, so <laughs> it's going to really suck because they have to protect themselves like this is their livelihood. So I think what B.B. Rexa, who's a country singer, a phone, somebody threw their whole phone, hit her in the face. And of course, it's viral Jeez. and people are laughing. But like long term, mm-hmm. you know, she had a black eye and stitches. What are we what are we doing, y'all? What 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 are, humans? Well, Andrew, let me ask you this. I mean, you're you're an old school punk rocker. <laughs> that was part of the punk rock aesthetic. You know, there would be this interaction. They'd spit on each other. They would throw shit at each other. I mean, is that just what's happening now? Yeah. Who knows what weird diseases are lurking in my br- bloodstream after being, you know, spat on and and having stuff spilled on me over, you know, years of playing in a in a unfortunate punk band in the uh, in the '90s. And uh, I'm gonna be like a total hypocrite here, but. You know, it was understood that that was part of the culture, part of the ethos, part of the energy. And there was always a bit of, you know, sort of harmless responsibility about it. So people weren't throwing. Yeah. Well, there weren't phones back then. But uh, hmm. I mean, not, you know, cell phones. But if they, if you know, they threw a phone, throwing... you would feel it because it was the right. size of, you know, a small car. Yeah. They weren't throwing like rocks and bricks. When you're talking about a world where like people are sort of like creating their own spectacles constantly for social media, there's a lot more of a, you know, there's a bunch of different reasons to to throw things, right? And they're kind of different reasons than, hmm. you know, than why things get thrown at a punk show. You know, guys, this has been just a riveting conversation per usual, per Friday News Roundup. Vogue Robinson, Andrew Corrali, thank you so much for joining us today here on CityCast Las Vegas. Thanks, David. Thank you. And that's all for today here on CityCast Las Vegas. 
Our lead producer is Sonia Cho Swanson, and our producer is Layla Mohammed. Our newsletter editors this week are Scott Dickensheets and Adrian Gonzalez, and our hosts are Vogue Robinson and me, David Figler. Music is by OG Moose and All the Kimonos. We record the show on the traditional homelands of the new movie, The Southern Paiute People. If you enjoyed the show, go tell a friend. Also, leave us a review and subscribe to our brilliant morning newsletter. We'll be back Monday morning with more news from around the city. Take care. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to go back. Thanks for the Vogue splain. You're welcome. Oh, my God, you guys. Um, also, who's Cardi B? <laughs> Vogapedia. Oh, sorry. Hold, please. Hold. If you don't know Cardi B, you cannot hold public office. Oh, wow. There you go. There's our test. We could all agree on that.